Good morning and welcome to the Unitarian Society of Santa Barbara. Our opening words this morning are by Langston Hughes. It's an earth song, and I've been waiting long for an earth song. It's a spring song, and I've been waiting long for a spring song, strong as the shoots of a new plant, strong as the bursting of new buds, strong as the coming of the first child from its mother's womb. It's an earth song, a body song, a spring song. I have been waiting long for this spring song. I'm the Reverend Julia Hamilton, and I'm delighted to welcome you here this morning, whether you're joining us here in our sanctuary or from our online sanctuary. We are here together in this space to nurture our spirits this morning, and I'm delighted to have with me a guest. Alice O'Connor is with us this morning. Alice is a friend who I got to know working with her on the Fund for Santa Barbara. She's also a professor of history and public policy at UCSB and she teaches about issues of wealth and poverty and global history. She's also the director of the Blum Center on Poverty, Inequality, and Democracy. And recently, the Fund for Santa Barbara has partnered with the Blum Center and other organizations to create um, a report call, uh, called the Central Coast Regional Equity Initiative toward a just and equitable Central Coast. And if you haven't had a chance to check this out, we'll make sure that a link goes out to this wealth of information about our region uh, and the inequities present in our region. We're here today for Earth Day to get in touch with our gratitude and kinship with the world around us, within us, among us. And I'd like to extend a special welcome to any visitors or guests we have here with us this morning. If you're joining us online, we have a virtual guest book. If you're here in person, we would love to see you in the garden after the service. There's a welcome table you can stop by. Ask any questions you like. We would love to get to know you better, help you get to know us. And there are all kinds of things going on here at the Unitarian Society beyond Sunday morning. We have our ongoing climate grief and action group. This is a, a kind of a test pilot project here at the Unitarian Society. And anyone is welcome to drop in on Wednesday evening online or in person in Parish Hall. If you're here in person, we can feed you dinner. If you're online, you're responsible for your own dinner, but bring it on to the group. And, uh, and it's a chance to process uh, our engagement with climate grief so that we don't get stuck and can move into action. We know that the moment we're living in um, brings all kinds of feelings to the surface around climate change and the climate crisis. And this is a group of people who want to help uh, support each other to move into action uh, in this important moment in our world. We are, of course, in the middle of our spring pledge campaign, so out in the garden today, there's a gratitude table. would love for you to stop by uh, and share a little bit about what you're grateful for right now. And of course, if you have received your pledge packet, we would love to have that in by May 15th. We really are hoping that everyone in the congregation will participate in this renewal uh, this spring as we regather uh, in person and online in this beloved community. And we have uh, also this spring heading towards our annual meeting. We are a democratically run congregation, which means you, the members of this community, get to vote on the things that matter. And we are looking at a vote coming up at our annual meeting in June. And there's two town hall meeting opportunities to talk about this proposed bylaw change. One of them is online this Wednesday. And I know all of you are thrilled to talk about bylaw changes. I can see it <laughs> in your faces. But if this is the kind of thing and you want to be interested in what's going on, uh, you can join online Wednesday evening. There'll be another opportunity in person and online in May to learn about all of this. I invite you now to take a breath. Wherever you are, whatever bylaw revisions you have been working on in your own life, whatever to-do lists you are carrying with you, go ahead and set that aside now. Allow yourself to be fully present here in this moment as we ring our bell and let the sound connect us.
If you're joining us from home and you have a candle or a chalice nearby, now is the time to get ready to light it with us. And if you'd like to type into the chat, chalice is lit, and the name of the street or the town you're joining us from so that we can see online all the different places and we can know here in this space we are joined by people across our community and across our nation. Our words for chalice lighting this morning are by Edward Everett Hale. I am only one, but still I am one. I cannot do everything, but still I can do something. And because I cannot do everything, I will not refuse to do the something that I can do. to kindle this morning, and that is our candle of memory for Jules Zimmer. Jules uh, died at home with his loved ones and family around him uh, just a few weeks before his 92nd birthday. He was an incredible force in this congregation and in the wider community. He gave so much here and beyond these walls. And we take a moment this morning to honor Jules, the work that he did in this world, to send him off with blessings and gratitude. And remember all of those who have come before us, who made their here, home here with us for a time. There will be a memorial for Jules here on Friday, May 13th at 2 p.m. And of course, all are welcome. So let us take a moment to remember Jules and all those who have come before us. Blessings on your journey, Jules, on this Earth Day. Every Sunday, we also lift up places that we see hope and inspiration in the world. We put it into our virtual hope jar, right? Reminding ourselves that if we look for it, we see actions large and small that inspire us, that motivate us to do our own bit to build beloved community in the world. So if you've seen something that gives you hope, you can type it into the chat or talk about it during coffee hour, share it with other folks so that we together can be inspired in this work we do. And for the hope jar, for our collective hope jar this morning, I would like to acknowledge the work of the Fearless Grandmothers. The Fearless Grandmothers uh, is a group dedicated to addressing the climate crisis in a multi-generational way. And I saw a picture of a quilt that they made here in this community and they displayed yesterday at the Earth Day celebrations. And it just, it was so beautiful and reminded me of this multi-generational work we do to address the climate crisis, but in this warm embrace of this beautiful uh, piece of art, this quilt that was embroidered with fearless sayings. So both beauty and fearlessness Hope and courage are embodied in their work, and the fearless grandmothers give me hope and all of us hope for the future. Let us now lift our hearts in song, so if you'd like to rise in body or spirit, join us at home. Uh, let us sing together. Matthew. Crazy. 
So this is Earth Day, and it's time when I'd like to invite maybe some of the kids to come forward. If you want to come help me out with something this morning, if there's some youth or young at heart, you can just join me up here on the rug if you want. And uh, we're going to do this together. This is a multi-generational activity this morning. Because it is Earth Day, and because we share this Earth with all kinds of creatures, not just humans, right? One of the reasons why we celebrate Earth Day is to remember the connection we have to everything around us in the world. I thought maybe we'd do a little gratitude exercise. And if you're online, you can join us too. We're going to start with the alphabet, and we're going to think of a creature that begins with every letter of the alphabet, A, B, C, and we're going to shout it out, right? And then we're going to give thanks for all of these amazing creatures, any kind of creature you can think of, right? So if you're joining us online, you can type it into the chat out here. I'm going to ask you all to help me, you all too. So let's just start with A. What's a creature that starts with A? Aardvark. Aardvark, right? The classic double A aardvark. And I'm spelling, I'm taking a risk and spelling in public, so you'll have to just go with me here. Okay, B. Bear. Bear, I heard bear. C. Cat. Cat. How many people have a cat in their life? Yeah, let's be grateful for cats. D. Dog. Dog. We can't leave them out. If we're going to go with cats, we've got to go with the How many people have dogs in their life? Yeah, let's be grateful for them, too. All right, E. Elephant. I started writing elephant, I think, even before I heard it. E F? Frog. Frog. Springtime and frogs. Growing up in New Orleans, we could hear the spring peepers, we called them, the little frogs. G? Giraffe. Giraffe. Always one of the favorites at the zoo, especially when they have babies. Okay, B C F G H. Hippopotamus. Hippopot. Are you gonna make me write out all of hippopotamus or can I just write hippo? H I Iguana. Iguana. Iguanas eat all kinds of mosquitoes for which I am grateful. Uh, H I J Jaguar. Jaguar. Beautiful animal. Uh, let's go with K. Kangaroo. Kangaroo. And I also heard koala. Also fine. It's not a competition. We love them all. L Lemur. lemur. I heard a lemur. L-M? Monkey. monkey. Who loves to watch the monkeys at the zoo? Yeah, me too. They're so fun. M-N? Uh, Narwhal. Narwhal. Right? Can't forget the ocean. I know there's an H in there somewhere. I hope I put it in the right place. L-M-N-O? Ocelot. Ocelot. That's what I heard. The cats are getting a lot of love this morning. P? Panda. The panda cam at the National Zoo is always really fun. If you haven't checked out the panda cam lately, there's a couple options. I'm going to PQ. Quail. Also the time when you might see them bobbing along with their little babies in the springtime. I'm going to PQ. R. Rhinoceros. Rhinoceros. Again, uh, I'm just going to write rhino. <laughs> R.S. Snake. Snake. Uh, often you might see them this time of year when you're out on the trails, right? Be careful. T? Turtle. We had a turtle wander into our kitchen here at the Unitarian Society from across the park one day. We walked into the kitchen and there was just this turtle hanging out and we had to bring it home. You? Don't know how it got across the street. You. Unicorn. Right? Yes. Right? Unicorns. All kinds of creatures in our lives. STU? Let's see if I, oh, I'm going to have to write sideways. V? Vulture, right? Very important in the food chain. W? Whale. Whale. Back to the ocean. Uh, TVWX? Uh, gosh. What was that? There's a lizard that starts at the next. Okay, I'm going to go with one. Xenobiology. <laughs> Life somewhere out in the universe that we haven't discovered yet. <laughs> or the lizard that starts with X. <laughs> Somebody will look it up before the end of this morning, I'm sure. Why? Yak. 
and Z zebra. Okay, so now what we're gonna do, we have a plethora of wonderful creatures. We're gonna say thank you, Earth, for as we name them off. So you can all join me in saying, thank you, Earth, for aardvarks. Thank you, Earth, for bears. Thank you, Earth, for cats. Thank you, Earth, for dogs. Thank you, Earth, for elephants. Thank you, Earth, for frogs. Thank you, Earth, for giraffes. Thank you, Earth, for hippos. Thank you, Earth, for iguanas. Thank you, Earth, for jaguars. Thank you, Earth, for kangaroos. Thank you, Earth, for lemurs. Thank you, Earth, for monkeys. Thank you, Earth, for narwhals. Thank you, Earth, for ocelots. Thank you, Earth, for pandas. Thank you, Earth, for quails. Thank you, Earth, for rhinos. Thank you, Earth, for snakes. Thank you, Earth, for turtles. Thank you, Earth, for unicorns. Thank you, Earth, for vultures. Thank you, Earth, for whales. Thank you, Earth, for those lizards that start with X. <laughs> thank you, Earth, for yaks. And thank you, Earth, for zebras. We will now sing you to the rest of your activities. And as you go out into this Earth, see if you can keep an eye out for all those creatures that we share the world with and give a little thanks of gratitude for them. going to be sending a delegation from Santa Barbara to the Posada del Migrante shelter in Mexicali. And four members of this congregation, and we have a representative of Trinity here, who are going to be going down bringing supplies that we have fundraised for here in Santa Barbara to provide food and basic necessities to the shelter that houses up to 300 people who are stuck at the border seeking asylum in the United States, fleeing violence and poverty and climate crisis where in their country of origin. And many of the people stuck in that shelter are families with children. And so not only are we sending the supplies that we fundraised for for food and supplies for the general shelter, our coming of age class has partnered with the youth from Trinity Episcopal to raise funds to purchase art supplies and gather uh, books in Spanish to start a children's library at the shelter. So we are sending nine suitcases like this one full of art supplies and books. And we are, yes, it's worth applauding for. Our youth raised over $1,500 in addition to the funds that were raised by the congregation and the Interfaith Sanctuary Alliance. And we're not just sending suitcases, we're sending people along with them. So with Deb Karoff and Anna DeStefano and Linda Beers and John Altman and Lorinda Marshall from Trinity, please come up and join me up here. And we have a prayer for our travelers and then we're gonna join us together in the spirit of blessing to send them on their way. <laughs> uh -oh. It's got wheels, this, and they're not all this big, so. <laughs> so the prayer for travelers was written by my friend and colleague, Angela Herrera, and she wrote it in both English and Spanish. So I am going to read the English version, and then John Altman will read the prayer in Spanish. This is a prayer for all the travelers, for the ones who start out in beauty, who fall from grace, who step gingerly looking for the way back, and for those who are born into the margins, who travel from one liminal space to another, crossing boundaries in search of center. This is a prayer for the ones whose births are a passing from darkness to darkness, who all their lives are drawn toward the light and keep moving. And for those whose journeys are a winding road that begins and ends in the same place, though only when the journey is completed 
do they finally know where they are. For all the travelers, young and old, aching and joyful, weary and full of life, the ones who are here and the ones who are not here, the ones who are like you and they're all like you, and the ones who are different, for in some ways we each travel alone. This is a prayer for traveling mercies and sure-footedness, for clear vision, for bread, for your body and spirit, for water, for your safe arrival, and for everyone you see along the way. Oración para los viajeros. Esta oración es para todos los viajeros, para los que comienzan en la belleza y caen de la gracia, quienes caminan tímidamente buscando la manera de volver, y para los que nacen en los márgenes, viajando de un lugar liminal a otro, cruzando fronteras en busca del centro. Es una oración para aquellos cuyo nacimiento es el paso de oscuridad a oscuridad, aquellos que se sienten atraídos por la luz y avanzan hacia ella, y para aquellos cuyas jornadas son un camino sinuoso que comienza y termina en el mismo lugar, aunque solo al terminar sabrán por fin dónde están. Para todos los viajeros jóvenes y viejos, dolientes y alegres, cansados y llenos de vida, los presentes y los ausentes, los que son como tú, y todos son como tú, y los que son distintos, porque de alguna manera todos viajamos solos. Esta es una oración por la misericordia para que andes con pie firme y visión clara por el pan para tu cuerpo y tu espíritu, por el agua, para que llegues seguro y para todos aquellos que encuentres en el camino. Will you now please rise in body and spirit? The words for this shared blessing are on the screen. Please join us at home as well. Just extend your love and care out to these fine folks and all who are traveling with them and read with me. Thank you for embodying Oh no, well repeat after me. <laughs> Thank you for embodying the loving spirit of this community. Thank you for embodying the loving spirit of this community. We bless you as you carry out this work of compassion and connection. We bless you as you carry out this work of compassion and connection. And we hold you in our hearts until your safe return. And we hold you in our hearts until your safe return. Thank you. I invite you now into a moment of prayer, reflection, and meditation. I invite you to once again remember your breath, settle yourself in your body in space. Remember that you share this space with other bodies here in this room, other bodies at home, across this world. And our words for meditation this morning are inspired and adapted by Gretchen Haley, and then we will move into a time of quiet. Collect yourself here, your stardust heart and soil-dipped toes. Collect your river-twisting veins and sky-seeking eyes. Forget your stories of separation from the earth, from life, from your breath from all the others breathing here and everywhere. Hold in your pulse the sounds of the chickadee and the flicker, the smell of ponderosa pine, the ache of the wind. Rest in the courage of the ancestors, the longing of the future, the steady truth of here and now, the beating of your heart. 
here and now. Let us enter into a time of quiet. I know. I know. No, no, not forgetting it. No, I've never not seen where it says rename yourself. love how times of quiet are never times of silence. Even life makes noise all around us, and I love that. Our reading this morning is The World Has Need of You by Ellen Bass. I can hardly imagine it as I walk to the lighthouse, feeling the ancient prayer of my arms swinging in counterpoint to my feet. Here I am, suspended, between the sidewalk and twilight, the sky dimming so fast it seems alive. What if you felt the invisible tug between you and everything? A boy on a bicycle rides by, his white shirt open, flaring behind him like wings. It's a hard time to be human. We know too much and too little. Does the breeze need us, the cliffs, the gulls? If you've managed to do one good thing, the ocean doesn't care. But when Newton's apple fell toward the earth, the earth, ever so slightly, fell toward the apple as well. So ends our reading. Each month, as we take up our offertory here at the Unitarian Society, we also give 25% of that collection to a project or program that lives our values in the world. And this month, our outreach offering partner is Alternatives to Violence Project here in Santa Barbara, which helps work with local youth to find peaceful ways to resolve conflict, alternatives to ways of violent living. It's a fantastic project, uh, and I'm sure if you want to know more, you can check out Alternatives to Violence. Um, please give as generously as you are able and read with me the affirmation of gratitude and giving. Maybe. Yes, there it is. Let us be grateful when we are able to give, for many do not have that privilege. And let us be grateful for those who share their gifts with us, for we are enriched by their giving. And let us be grateful even for our needs, so that we may learn from the generosity.
Thank you, Matthew. Heather Levin has a Sunday off, and Matthew is accompanying us on piano as well as uh, with a voice this morning. It's wonderful. Thank you. And now I would like to invite my dear friend and colleague here in town in the work for justice and work to build a sustainable earth for everyone on the Central Coast, uh, Alice O'Connor. It's so wonderful to have you here with us this morning. Oh, it's nice to be free of that <laughs> for the moment. Uh, well, uh, good morning, everyone. It's wonderful uh, to see you. I want to thank Julia so much. Um, and thank, thanks to all of you for inviting me to, um, to be part of your Earth Day service. Uh, I mean, I'm especially glad. I, I, I want to give a shout out to the uh, online sanctuary, but I'm really especially glad to be in to be here in person I, you know we are gradually emerging from this strange period i hope we are gradually emerging from this strange period of semi isolation it's one it's really just great to be in a space together to remind ourselves um, of the importance of the energy and sense of connectivity that comes from actually being in a physical space uh, together, um, and um, you know uh, that it, it's something I've been reminded of because we have returned. We've it's been a little bit off and on, going in and out of the classroom, and there's just nothing like um, the energy of actually being in a room with students and being reminded of that has been a source of tremendous renewal, tremendous renewal for us. And I feel that same sense now on this Earth Day in particular, a sense of renewal and reawakening. Um, so again, thank you. And also, thank you for putting a gigantic smile on my face that you couldn't see from behind the mask when, we were, when I was trying to think of what begins with X. Um, couldn't come up with it. Um, so Santa Barbara, of course, has a deep current of connectivity. And connectivity is a big theme when we think about um, Earth Day and the things that we want to celebrate uh, uh, on Earth Day. Um, a, a, a current of connectivity to the values and commitments that Earth Day has come to represent. Now, as we all know, Santa Barbara celebrates itself as the site not just of that massive 1969 oil spill that helped to galvanize and accelerate public recognition of the ecological consequences of our carbon-dependent economy. Now, it, it accelerated rec public recognition, not necessarily action. We've got a lot of work to do on that front. But Santa Barbara also prides itself as being, uh, and rightly so, as being this, a, a site of the movement to protect and preserve the integrity of the natural world. On a deeper level, though, Santa Barbara's connection to the Earth and to Earth Day stems from the more gradually widening recognition that we live and work and conduct our communal activities on the unceded lands of the Chumash peoples, and that it is incumbent upon us to work in solidarity with nature and with Native communities to acknowledge and redress the legacies of colonial practices, the legacies of colonial practices on the environment and on Native communities, including support in their efforts to achieve economic and cultural freedom and recognition. That deeper level of recognition and connectivity is in turn connected to what I'd like to talk about with you today, at least for the few minutes I have with you. Um, and that is the shifting framework of environmental stewardship and activism. Um, a shifting frame, framework that has come over the course of several decades, but increasingly so in recent years, to elevate the values of equity and justice and to center equity and, and justice as vital, indeed defining environmentalist goals. This question, of how we envision and how we actually get to equity and justice, economic, social, cultural, as well as environmental, 
is at the heart of the Central Coast Regional Equity Initiative, um, a collaborative initiative, as Julia noted, that was recently launched by the Fund for Santa Barbara and the UCSB Blum Center for Poverty, Inequality, and Democracy. Um, with the release of, of the report that Julia cited uh, in the preview for today's service, um, and also I've got the I've got the cover here. It's mostly uh, we're being very green. We're distributing it principally online, but here is the cover. Um, and I do, you know, encourage you. Julia um, linked to it uh, in uh, the announcement for this week, so uh, you have access, and we have ways of getting getting it out to you um, if you'd like. So in this report that was conducted in partnership with the U, um, USC Equity Research Institute, we draw on publicly available data, regional research, and community consultations to um, provide a profile of the widening inequities, including the widening environmental inequities, that over the course of recent decades in particular have come to shape life on the Central Coast. Um, and we want to use that profile, not just to document, but to serve as the basis of a broadly participatory conversation about how we can work collectively, underscore the collectively, to achieve, actually to achieve equity and justice through changes in policies, practice, and community action. Now, while the study touches on a broad range of issues, and again, I encourage you to read it, uh, at least to look at the executive uh, summary. Um, for purposes of today's discussion and in recognition of Earth Day, I want to emphasize three basic insights that we can glean from our look at the dimensions and the dynamics of uh, environmental inequity. First is that the path toward environmental equity and justice begins from the acknowledgement that that's at the heart of the poem that uh, of Ellen Bass's that uh, Julia just read to you. Um, this is also a, an acknowledgement and an understanding that comes to us from Native communities, and that is the acknowledgement of the basic interdependence that embeds humans in the natural environment. Um, it's an acknowledgement that understands the possibilities uh, that as, as creatures that are embedded in the broader environment, we have numerous possibilities for cultivating relationships of reciprocity, relationships of regeneration, relationships of mutual nurturing. All of those things are opened up by that essential acknowledgement of our inter interdependence with the uh, natural world around us. Now, this stands in contrast to the conventions and norms that continue to drive economic practices in our society and here on the Central Coast. Practices and conventions of extraction, practices and conventions of commodification, of dominance, and of so-called improvements. This is why understanding and embracing this acknowledgement of our essential interdependence uh, requires a, a cultural and political shift, not just a shift in individual attitudes. I would at least um, surmise that a number of us have already come to that acknowledgement. A number of, of us in this room have already come to the acknowledgement of an essential inter interdependence. But that doesn't mean that we as a society, as a, and, uh, as a culture, and as an economy have come to that acknowledgement. And that is a very big part of the work of environmental equity and justice. A second insight is that the path toward environmental equity and justice involves reckoning with some uncomfortable um, realities, or I suppose we could call them inconvenient truths, to use Al Gore's language in his 2006 documentary. Realities about the vast racial and class disparities in the experience of environmental harms and hazards. About the way these environmental inequities intersect with and are compounded by inequities of health, housing, disability, economic opportunity, and political voice, as they are experienced in particular in communities of col color. 
here on the Central Coast, as well as elsewhere in the United States and around the world. A reckoning with the price we pay as a society for enduring environmental inequities. Price, a price we pay in the form of diminished um, civic capacity to respond to shared vulnerabilities, to recognize actually shared vulnerabilities and to respond to shared vulnerabilities, needs, and tragically, um, to prevent the needless loss of life that we have become so palpably aware of in the past couple of years. And a reckoning as well with the way these inequities stem from policies and political choices that we as a region, we as a society, make and uphold day after day and year after year. There is nothing inevitable with, about the environmental or other inequities that have shaped, um, shaped life on the Central Coast. Uh, the consequences of, of these inequities, of course, fall disproportionately on the workers and communities of color that we rely on for the region's celebrated prosperity, another dimension of the reckoning that we need to come to terms with. And a third insight from setting ourselves that, that will help us to get on the road towards uh, environmental equity and justice uh, is that although these challenges that we face, this reckoning that we need to come to, um, and these inconvenient truths that we need to confront, um, these may seem, seem daunting, um, massive, transformational, um, I would argue that the path toward, excuse me for a sec, the path toward environmental equity and justice can be approached with joy, has to be approached with joy. Specifically, the joy and affirmation that comes from reconnecting with one another, with the earth, and from the starting point, kinship, mutual respect, and solidarity, rather than the starting point of extraction, dominance, and embattlement. So before elaborating a little bit more on how these themes play out in Santa Barbara and the Central Coast and how they're reflected in our study, I want to share a vignette that captures the deep challenges as well as the potential joys of the path toward environmental equity and justice. And that is the story of a woman named Pamela Roosh. Um, Pamela Roosh is a, a, an African-American an African mother of two from Lowndes County, Alabama, um, who became known as a leading activist for environmental and economic justice. Now, as many of you know, Lowndes County is substantially African-American, a uh, heavily rural community, uh, a community that has long struggled with high rates of poverty and unemployment, with a lack of access to, ad to adequate health care and related services. And it is well known as a site of um, amply documented envir environmental hazards that are due to toxic waste, toxic wa waste dumping, and a notoriously dysfunctional sewer system, all compounded by racialized voter suppression that has kept these issues, not from being recognized, but kept these issues from being addressed. Pamela Roosh herself struggled with disability and on the edge of poverty for most of her adult life. But at the heart of her struggles was the doubly toxic, toxic burden of environmental exposure and crippling debt. Again, a dimension of the intersectionality, an expression of the intersectionality um, that comes with these environmental inequities. Um, the, her exposure to toxic waste as well as toxic de debt um, stemmed from a predatory loan that she took out to finance the purchase of a threadbare, itself environmentally toxic mobile home that turned into a nightmare of escalating interest rates and hazardous environmental exposure the longer she lived there and, and the longer she and her children were exposed to the hazards of inadequate, uh, of inadequate in environment. Now, things started to turn around for Pamela when her situation came to the attention of the Center 
for rural enterprise and environmental justice, and when it came to the attention of the Poor People's Campaign. The Poor People's Campaign is a contemporary extension of Martin Luther King's famed campaign for economic justice that he first launched in late 1967 and 1968 and was the final campaign of uh, his too short life. But it's a campaign that continued um, after his death and that has recently been revived um, by a coalition of, uh, uh, of spiritual, religious, and activist uh, organizations. Now, Pamela was a featured speaker at the Poor People's Campaign March on Washington in 2018 when her extraordinarily powerful testimony, telling her life story, and essentially coming before a very high-powered and high-level congressional uh, hearing drew attention to the environmental health and economic plight, not only of Pamela herself, but of the disenfranchised communities of color across the nation. This testimony, which took tremendous courage on her part, you can actually see it online, it's quite extraordinary. This turned Pamela Roosh into an activist and into an organizer and into a source of inspiration and joy for economic and environmental justice. It turned Pamela into a source of inspiration as well for the, her surrounding community as well as for communities of color across the country. Now, sadly, not long after Pamela had started to realize, um, uh, uh, Pamela had started to uh, become an activist for uh, change, um, her own situation did start to turn around and she began to achieve economic and housing stability with the help of the organizing campaign that she became a part of. Not long after that, though, news was released that Pamela herself had succumbed in Selma, Alabama to the consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic. Although not without leaving an enduring legacy that is still celebrated to this day of courage and activism and solidarity and joy in the cause of broader economic and environmental justice. Pamela and others around her found kinship as well as joy and meaning in the movement for economic and environmental justice. They continue, Pamela and others, continue to take on this gigantic movement towards, um, this gigantic project of moving towards transformational change with, again, a sense of solidarity, joy, but also moving towards that goal by building, um, building solidarity uh, with others and, and starting, starting from where they are, not, not necessarily saying we've got to take on everything at once, but starting from local community. And that, I would argue, I would suggest is a lesson that we can take from her life and legacy. Now, Pamela Roosh's story is not an isolated one, nor is it so very distant from the experience we're having here on the Central Coast. As we note in our study toward a just an equitable central coast. It is echoed in the experience of communities of color right here in our own backyard in Santa Barbara in Ventura County, uh, which, is, which is the focus of, of our study. Um, communities of color, as we document in the study, are disproportionately exposed to the hazards of pollution, pesticides, climate disaster, toxic waste, and as, uh, recently, as recently, people recently uh, designated as frontline workers to the hazards of the pandemic as well. These disparities were catapulted into public consciousness during the Thomas fire, when people who would only later be designated as essential workers found themselves cut off from employment or, in the case of farm workers in particular, pressured to get back into the fields despite hazardous conditions. They also found themselves largely without access to relief or other forms of emergency assistance that others could rely on to get by, in part 
because resources that were made available to many in the community were not translated into the language that, 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 that would make them accessible, but also because so many of the communities of color that we rely on for our own pr prosperity um, don't have the benefits of, uh, of legal documentation and recognition and therefore access to assistance uh, in our community, in the state, and in, the, in this country. Now, fortunately, recognition of that, recognition of that dimension, that personal experience, but also of the broader structural dimensions of environmental, and consequences of environmental inequities has become the source of a growing, widening, and increasingly dynamic infrastructure of region-wide social justice activism. Activism that is at once responsive to evolving social conditions and that focuses on achieving lasting structural and transformative change. Two examples that we discuss in our study that we could point to, and, that, and these are examples among many. One is the 805 Undocu Fund, a joint effort of the Central Coast Alliance United for a Sustainable Economy, or CAUSE, um, of the future leaders for um, uh, uh, future leaders of America and of a Mixteco Indigenous Community Organizing Project, or MICA. Since 2018, and largely as a result of the, the recognition of what was going on as a result of the uh, Thomas Fire, these three organizations have collaborated on a collective cross-county effort to provide vital assistance to local undocumented immigrant individuals and families who have suffered losses due to the disasters of wildfires, mudslides, and more recently, the COVID-19 pandemic, but who, as I suggested before, are excluded from federally funded safety net and disaster relief programs, but who are also largely rendered invisible uh, in broader discussions of the um, uh, of the experience of the experience of those environmental hazards and of the COVID-19 pandemic as well. A second inspiring and important and ongoing and solidaristic effort is represented in the Central Coast Climate Justice Network, a coalition of organizations committed to a climate movement that advances social, economic, racial, and environmental justice for Ventura and Santa Barbara counties that has forged a regional partnership between social justice, anti-racism, and more traditionally conceptualized environmental movements. And that is embracing this growing and changing and widening framework of moving towards environmental equity and justice. Um, now, this group, the Central Coast Climate Justice Network, has been engaged in a, a grassroots house meeting campaign to consult with people where they live, uh, to start with where they are, and to invite people around the, uh, around the region to envision and to work collaboratively to think about what a Green New Deal uh, would look like for Santa Barbara and Ventura County. A Green New Deal that are based on the values of kinship, solidarity, intersectionality, uh, and interdependence with nature, and that, above all, start in their work towards transformative change from a place of joy and, inter and, and interdependence as part of the pathway toward achieving equity and environmental justice for all. So I, I hope that we can um, count on one another, I suppose, to join with these ongoing efforts and to join with the Central Coast Regional Equity Initiative to advance this conversation about how we collectively can achieve the values that we uh, are continuing to celebrate uh, on Earth Day, but uh, that we can kind of make part of our everyday way of life. Thank you so much, and I welcome the opportunity for further conversation.
and if you want any more information on how to get involved with any of what we talked about, you know, talk to me or talk to Alice after the service. There's lots of ways to get going. Uh, we don't have to do everything, but all of us can do something. And in the spirit of joy and kinship, uh, let us sing once more, all creatures of the earth and sky, and let this be an invitation to connect with that sense of being interdependent and interconnected with our world. Stay right where you are if you'd like to put your hands over your heart or with permission put your hands on the shoulder of someone next to you or rise at home or just get connected get to that place where you feel that interconnection that interdependence and as you go forth into this beautiful and heartbreaking world this world that is a kinship that we move out into this space and feeling of kinship with all that is around us May the light of love shine upon you, out from within you, be gracious unto you, and bring you peace. For this is the day we are given. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And let us call out a blessing. Mm -hmm. 